everyone. It's Mr. Slamka, and today I wanted to talk to you about section 11.3, which is on collecting data. And this is going to be part one of two parts. So um, th to begin with, in section 11.3, I want you to notice that we're going to be talking about population and sample again. So in section 11.2, we had talked about the difference between population and sample and looked very closely. And we had discussed how population is usually challenging to collect because populations are so big and samples are a little bit more easy to work with. So um, a sample is, once again, a subset of a population that you can actually collect information from. So this is um, just going to be a little bit easier for you to do. And so you're going to want to go down this path a lot of times if you're trying to collect data. So now, there, unfortunately, when you are taking a sample, there are some good ways to do it, but there's also some bad ways to do it. And so we've got some sampling techniques right here. And so we're going to go through some of those sampling techniques. I'll talk to you about which ones are the good ones and which ones are the bad ones. So here's one of the most popular ways to collect a sample of data, and it's called self-selected. And what's going to happen here is that there will be members of a population that you're interested in, and those members will choose to be part of the survey and the sample. And so what's going to happen here is that maybe they'll be handed a survey, and they'll either choose to fill it out or they'll choose not to. Um, this happens all the time on Amazon. Every time you buy a product, you can choose to fill out the survey or not. And so this is going to be self-selection. Next, systematic. Systematic right here is a, a less popular option. And what's going to happen here is that, uh, members of the population are going to be chosen. They don't get to have a choice in the matter. They are chosen. And it is going to be based off of some kind of pattern. So maybe you talk to every seventh person. And when you do talk to seven, every seventh person, those are the ones you're going to get your data from. Next, stratified. Stratified right here has, is a word that you may have heard when referring to rocks or stone in a science class. Um, stratified means a population is going to be broken up into groups. And these groups are going to be based off of some sort of similar traits. And then what's going to happen is that a, a random sample is going to be selected from each group. That means that there will be some people that are selected from the, uh, the low group, and some are going to be selected from the medium group, and some are going to be selected from the high group, or some are going to be selected from uh, any of those numbers of different groups that you might have. This is a good sampling technique right here. Cluster. Cluster is very similar, and so they can get tricky to tell the difference. But cluster is going to be, once again, broken up. So once again, you're going to break up your groups into, with, by similar traits. But then what's going to happen is that you are going to only be sampling from one or some of the groups, and you're not going to be sampling from all of the groups. That means that certain groups will be overrepresented, and other groups will be underrepresented. This is a bad sampling technique right here. Convenience. Convenience is our next sample, and this is another very popular one. And convenience is going to make it very easy for the surveyor, because what they're going to do is they're going to talk to people that are easy to access. And maybe they're easy to access emotionally, meaning that maybe you're friends with them and you have your, their phone number and you know that they would be happy to help you out with a survey. Or maybe they're easy to access because they're just geographically close by. But the convenience sample is always going to make it easiest on the person who's asking the question. And that's bad. Um, that person needs to do the extra work to make sure they have a good sample, and this is a bad sample most of the time. Lastly, random. So a random sample is going to be one of the trickiest to come up with. Members of a population are selected by a computer or by a lottery. All people are equally likely to be chosen. That means that if you live close by or if you don't live uh, close by at all, if you are a friend or if you are a complete stranger, it is still likely that you will get chosen. Lastly, um, we had talked about this in the last lesson, and it's back again, a census. A census is a very special kind of uh, sample because it will include every member of the population, and that makes it very, very extra special and very accurate. It is also very difficult. This is the best way to sample a group, uh, but it is also extremely difficult to do. All right, so now we have been talking about good samples and bad samples. But when I say good samples and bad samples, there's actually some terminology for that, and that's right here. A good sample is called an unbiased sample, and a bad sample is called a biased sample. Unbiased samples mean is a sample that accurately re represents the entire population, the lows, the mediums, the highs, everyone. Um, so the, everybody is going to be represented very, very nicely. A bias sample is going to be an inaccurate representation of the population, and typically some subsets are overrepresented and others are underrepresented. This will come from things like self-selected or convenience sampling. Those are ones you want to try to avoid. 
I am going to now show you a couple of examples, and what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to decide exactly what sampling technique was used, and then we're going to try to decide if it was a good sample, unbiased, or a bad sample, bias. So let's read a couple of these. So it says right here, the teacher surveys every seventh student uh, and goes through the lunch line. Let me start from the beginning, I should say. A teacher wants to survey every, uh, everyone in her school about the quality of the Chartwell lunches. Identify the type of sample described and decide if the sample is biased or not. So in this first case right here, it says a teacher surveys every seventh student and goes, that goes through the lunch line. So now every seventh student means that she's using a pattern right here, and that pattern is going to be systematic. So we know that this is going to be a systematic problem. Now the bad news is that the system she used relied heavily on the fact that the students were lined up to buy lunch. So now this is a trick. Uh, because this is going to make our sample very biased. Typically, systematics are unbiased, but this one is going to be biased. If you have students that are lined up to buy lunch, they probably think that the Chartwell lunches are pretty okay, or even great. If you feel passionately that the Chartwell lunches are awful, you're probably not lined up. And so that means this teacher will not be accepting your information, and uh, you will be underrepresented. B. 150 students are cho chosen from a random name lottery, and the teacher surveys each student. So now this is definitely going to be a random sample, and random samples are the best because they are very unbiased. Uh, she could pick people that like the Chartwell lunches, or don't like the Chartwell lunches, or just think that they're okay, or maybe just go for the cookies. I'm not quite sure, but she can get uh, everybody's opinion in this situation. C. The teacher organizes a homeroom and has every person in the building fill out the survey. So now, in a perfect day, if everyone was at school, this would be a census. And census is the best type of sample because it will cover the entire population, which means that it is incredibly unbiased. Everybody is represented perfectly, and no one is overrepresented or underrepresented. That would be extremely difficult, though, because there are always people who are absent from school on a daily basis. D. The teacher chooses to survey 50 freshmen, 50 sophomores, 50 juniors, and 50 seniors. This is a great uh, way of sampling, and it is stratified. So you have a good equivalent number of each class being represented here, so that no one is overrepresented or underrepresented. Even the seniors are represented, the ones who usually go out to lunch. So they are not uh, probably thinking too much about Charwells at this point. Next, on the back side, what I have is I have a couple more examples that I'd like you to try out on your own. These are, once again, going to hide a couple of tricks, so you need to watch out. Please pause the video now, and then I'll share some answers with you after that. Okay, we're back. Right here, it says a local politician wants to survey his constituents. Those are the people that he works for. He mails surveys to the constituents that are members of his political party, and he uses the surveys that are returned. So now this is a very, very long statement, and there are lots of twists and turns, and so there's lots of ways that you might think and feel confident about, but we must pick the one that it really boils down to. So one of the first things that people notice is that he is sending out surveys, which would feel very, very, very kind of convenient, and so this seems like a convenient sample. But in reality, what's happening here is he's only accepting the ones that were returned, which means that it's actually self-selected. You have to choose whether you're going to turn, return that survey to your politician or not. Lastly, um, self-selected is usually very biased, but there are a lot of reasons in here why this is an extremely biased case right here. So to begin with, he only sent out the, the surveys to people who were members of his political party. So that means that there is another political party out there that did not receive the survey, and so that makes it extremely biased. Second, it is self-selected, so that makes it extremely biased as well. So there are going to be a couple of situations right here that make this a very, very bad way of going about things and not something that you should do. Next one. A newspaper is conducting a survey to find out uh, people's favorite sport. A newspaper asks every other person attending a baseball game. So now right off the bat, it does say every other person. So this is very systematic. And so that is exactly what we've got going on here. And typically systematic means that it would be 
unbiased. It would be a very good survey, but unfortunately their location was rather convenient. So right here what they've done is they've only gone to one sporting event, which happens to be a baseball game, and so that means that it is far more likely that people would tell you that their favorite sport was baseball and less likely that they would pick a different sport. And so you need to make sure that you would go to maybe a lot of different sporting events, or even better, talk to people about sports even when they're not at a sporting event. Number three, a pet store wants to know what people's favorite breeds of dog is, so they print up survey cards and leave them on a table for customers to fill out when they enter the store. Once again, this feels very, very convenient because they're printing up the cards, but it ultimately, it is self-selected. Uh, self-selected is because you choose whether you want to fill out that card or not. Next, it is certainly bias. Only people who have extremely strong opinions will be filling out that card. The people who love the pet store are going to fill out the card, or the people that hate the pet store are going to fill out the card. But if you just feel okay about it, or if you're in a rush, you're not going to fill out the card, and you're now underrepresented. Number four. A health club wants to know how often members uh, attend aerobics classes. A club surveys every person who attends the 9 a.m. Zumba class and the 6 p.m. Pilates class. So now this is going to be a cluster. What we've done here is we have grouped people up based off of what class they go to and what time of day they go. And now we've only selected from some of those groups. So we didn't talk to anybody who showed up midday. We only talked to morning people and evening people, and that makes it very, very biased. Last one. A health club wants to know how often members attend aerobics classes. A club employee uses the club's computer system to track the total number of aerobic class visits for all members of the club. So because this is a nice centralized location for the data, it's easy to get an entire population's worth of information. It's easy to collect census information. That means that this is extremely unbiased and a perfect sample right here. Okay, if you have any questions, please send me an email. If you are all done with these notes, please move on to the worksheet and the final 11.3 check. There's a second video that will be coming up as well, which is 11.3 Part 2. Make sure you watch that one as well.